is up. Good mic work. Back at you. Got a lot to talk about this week. I'm sorry for not being up here as regularly as normal. Those of you who follow along with what's going on with me in my personal life know that I'm going through a move right now and I'm in a temporary place while I wait for my new place to get finished. So my commentaries throughout the month of September are going to be a little bit weird and a little bit inconsistent and I might have to combine a few, which is what I'm doing tonight. In this episode, we're going to talk about this past week's Monday Night Raw and this past week's SmackDown as well as predict the Backlash pay-per-view. I'm also going to give a few thoughts on UFC 203 which I believe is this Saturday night and CM Punk's debut in the UFC, and a few other wrestling news tidbits going around as well, including news on Alberto Del Rio and Scott Hall. So we'll try to get through this relatively quickly. I do want to let everybody know that earlier today I did release my latest Q&A, so if you weren't aware of that, go to my channel and check it out. I'll put a link up here on the screen as well for you. It really wasn't my favorite Q&A that I've done in recent memory. Uh, I feel like I revisited a couple of topics that I've talked about before, and also I recorded the thing in two different locations at my old place and a little bit at my new place, and the audio is just a little bit up and down because the acoustics in my temporary place that I'm in right now are terrible. Uh, There's a big echo, and I'm right next to a very busy road, so there's fucking cars going by and shit all the time. So I'm trying to do my best to kind of shield my microphone from some of this noise. So if you hear any of that, if you hear a car, if you hear a horn honk or whatever, I sincerely apologize. I'm in a temporary place, and I can't do anything about it. My new place is in a quiet neighborhood, extremely quiet, no busy streets, no nothing. I have a whole room dedicated to producing good mic work content. But I'm not going to be in that room until October 1st. So between now and then, things will just be a little bit weird, uh, like I've said time and time again over the past couple of weeks. First thing we'll do is touch on Monday Night Raw from this past Monday. I definitely would say that Raw was a better show than SmackDown. I watched SmackDown last night live. I even tweeted about it. Got my tweet up, by the way, on uh, Talking Smack, which was cool. During a segment when Daniel Bryan was talking, a few of you tweeted me that. And I was like, holy shit. So I put that up on Twitter. That was kind of cool. Does that mean I'm famous now? I don't know. But I wasn't terribly enamored with SmackDown, to be honest. I mean, for a go-home show, I thought it was pretty weak. There was only one major angle on that show that I found interesting, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. First of all, let's just briefly discuss Raw. Uh, I won't go through everything here. We'll just talk about the key points and the highlights. Now, of course, last week was the awesome main event where Kevin Owens won the Universal title and Triple H came out and swerved everybody. Uh, The wrestling world is still buzzing about that. Everybody seems to be really happy with the decision and the angle and the swerve and Kevin Owens as the new champion. This past week on Raw was going to be his coronation ceremony, and he had hyped that all day on Twitter. And the show opens with an epic celebration for him. Balloons came down from the ceiling. Stephanie and Mick Foley came out to the ring. They had opened the show actually with a backstage segment, and Mick Foley was really pissed off about what happened last week, and he accused uh, Stephanie of being in cahoots with her husband and not informing him what was going on. He even told a sad story of how they first met and how he has always had a a soft spot for Stephanie, and he really hopes that she didn't lie to him and fuck him over and all this stuff. It seems like Steph's done a lot worse to Mick Foley earlier on in his career than this latest incident, but Stephanie is maintaining her innocence. She swears she had nothing to do with it. She had no idea that her husband was going to run out there, pedigree Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins, and basically hand the belt to Kevin Owens. But they play nice. Stephanie introduces Kevin Owens and congratulates him and gives him the big celebration that he's demanding. And they're kind of leaving the door open for speculation. Is this a big swerve? Is Stephanie really the heel that we all know she is? Or does she really you know, have a good side to her, and she really did not know anything about this. Mick Foley seems highly irritated and agitated and uncomfortable with the whole situation, and he just does not seem happy. But Kevin Owens comes out there in a suit. He's Mr. Corporate Man now. I was kind of hoping Triple H would come out there with him. I thought we would maybe see a Kevin Owens and Triple H alliance. I think that would be a lot of fun. We could still see that. I mean, Triple H can still make an appearance at the Clash of Champions or upcoming Monday Night Raws, so I definitely think that is a possibility. But for right now, Kevin Owens is out there on his own, and I love the fact that he got on the mic and just healed his ass off on the crowd because the fans are happy. Kevin Owens is very popular. 
Uh, he can work in the ring. He's great on the mic. What's not to like? The fans cheer for him. They were chanting, you deserve it. And he basically told him to fuck off, which I love. A lot of people were really mad when Seth Rollins came back as a heel instead of a babyface because fans wanted to cheer him. But in this instance, I, I don't care. I think Kevin Owens is a much better heel. I love the fact that he doesn't give a shit. He's got a little bit of that Stone Cold Steve Austin in him. You know, when Austin first started becoming a babyface, he was still very heelish. And every time the fans would cheer him, he'd be like, fuck off, man. I don't care if you like me or not. And that's kind of what Kevin Owens' attitude is, which I really like that from him. And I think this quote-unquote plan B and putting the belt on him uh, after Finn Balor's injury is going to work out just fine so far. Now, we knew we were going to hear from Seth Rollins. He, of course, makes an appearance, and he runs down to the ring. He's pissed off. He gets in Kevin Owens' face, tells him to shut the hell up. He's yelling at Stephanie. He's yelling at Mick Foley. Tensions finally boil over with him and Kevin Owens, and he attacks Kevin Owens and throws him outside of the ring, which prompts Stephanie to indefinitely suspend Seth Rollins, which is when McFoley steps in and says, enough's enough. No, he's not suspended. You trusted me with the matchmaking abilities, so I'm asking you to trust me now. Not only is Seth Rollins not suspended, but he's going to get a title shot against Kevin Owens at the Clash of Champions, which we already knew. The main event was leaked, but it was a pretty obvious main event. You knew that Seth was going to get that title shot. And the whole entire segment, I think, was one of the better opening raw promos that we've seen in a long time. Whenever you have any sort of big promo involving the authority and another wrestler in title shots, sometimes they just suck. But this one was good. Kevin Owens was awesome and hilarious as the new WWE Universal Champion. And then Seth Rollins was equally as intense when he came down there, got in Kevin Owens' face, really did a good job coming across furious that he got screwed over royally by Triple H and being very suspicious of Stephanie, just like Mick Foley is. And I liked everything I saw from Seth Rollins. And uh, backstage right after the segment, they made a couple of matches for Raw, Kevin Owens versus Sami Zayn and Chris Jericho versus Seth Rollins. Now, I think this is the beginning of the Seth Rollins babyface turn that we have all wanted. I said that right from the start when Seth Rollins came back that I was one of the few people that don't like it when a heel leaves, gets injured, and then just automatically comes back as a babyface, much like Triple H did in 2002 when he returned to one of the biggest ovations this business has ever seen after being one of the dirtiest heels this business has ever seen. So I don't really think any of that makes sense. I thought it would be better for Seth Rollins to initially come back as a heel because that's what we remember him as, and then he can slowly transition into a babyface throughout the summer and it looks like that is exactly what's happening he even worked with a heel on monday night raw taking on chris jericho and beating him with a pedigree and now he's going into this match with kevin owens you know virtually as the babyface, as another motorcycle goes by son of a bitch but anyway i like what i'm seeing from seth rollins i like what i'm seeing from kevin owens i think this is going to be a really fun feud and as we would see later on on monday night raw That match is not totally set in stone yet because Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins both had matches on Raw. Now, I mentioned Seth beat Jericho, and Kevin Owens defeated Sami Zayn. And we were all tweeting and stuff throughout the show like, wow, there's no Roman Reigns on the show so far tonight. I guess we're not going to get him on the show because we know that Rusev and Lana are off on their honeymoon, so they're off of TV. So we actually thought we were going to get an entire show without Roman Reigns at all. And then at the very end, after Kevin Owens is celebrating his victory, Roman Reigns comes out, comes down to the ring, gets in Kevin Owens' face, which I guess does make a little bit of sense because he was one of the people that was screwed over by Triple H last week. He got a pedigree too, and as a matter of fact, his came on the outside of the ring. So I can certainly understand his frustration, but he comes out there to confront Kevin Owens, which prompts Mick Foley to come out and make a match for next Monday Night Raw between Kevin Owens and Roman Reigns, and the stipulation is... If Roman Reigns wins, he will be inserted into the Clash of Champions main event, and it will become a triple threat match for the WWE title. Now, I'm not too concerned about this. I really don't care. If you ask me, it's fine, because there's a couple of ways to look at this here. Number one, if Rusev and Lana are given significant time off to be on their honeymoon, I mean, I think two weeks is enough, but some people have been talking about a month or or whatever. So if they're going to be off of TV for a little while, you have to do something with Roman Reigns. So it would make sense to put him in this main event and make it a triple threat. I think that would be good for a couple of reasons. Number one is they're not going to put the belt on Kevin Owens just to turn around and give it to Roman Reigns a few weeks later. So I think we can rule out him winning the Universal title at the Clash of Champions if he's able to defeat Kevin Owens next week on Raw and earn that spot. So I don't think he's winning the title anyway. 
Uh, and number two, it prolongs a little bit because sometimes I complain about things going too fast in WWE. And if they wait a little longer to do the one-on-one -on -one match between Seth Rollins and Kevin Owens, I'd be fine with that because I don't think Kevin Owens is going to drop the belt right away. So if he works one-on-one -on -one with Seth, you got to figure out a way for Kevin Owens to win and Seth not to lose steam as this brand new babyface at the same time. So making it a triple threat match might be a little bit better because imagine if Kevin Owens wins, which I expect him to, he can go out on TV and brag that he defeated two of the WWE's top stars in the same match, two-thirds of the Shield, two guys that have pretty much owned the WWE in the past couple of years. Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns combined have held that belt a lot of times for a long period of time over the last year or two. So Kevin Owens getting a victory over both of them I think would be huge for Kevin Owens' stock as a champion. So if Roman Reigns wins next week, you know, on one hand, I'm not a fan of champions losing. I, I hate it when they just give a champion a match against somebody, and then if they lose, that person gets a title shot. They do that too much. We just saw it with the women as well, I believe, on Raw with uh, Bailey and Charlotte. So I don't like it when they do that. So I guess it's a, uh, you know, I'm on the fence with it. I don't really want to see Kevin Owens lose next week, but if they did insert Roman into the main event, I'd be fine with it because I think it, uh, it works in a positive way going forward in, in the future. Um, but that's assuming that Rusev is truly taking this time off. We could see Rusev show up next week on Raw and cost Roman Reigns the match, setting up the Roman Reigns versus Rusev match at Clash of Champions for the U.S. belt, and Seth and Kevin Owens can stay a singles match. So they could also go in that direction, which I'd really be fine with. We've seen some signs of Roman Reigns being a little bit more vicious. The beating that he laid down on Rusev at SummerSlam and some of the things he's been doing and saying, you know, we could see a little bit of a turn in the tide here. You know, we're seeing Seth Rollins being pushed more as a babyface, and there's rumblings of Roman Reigns going heel. They could even do something in that triple threat match if it does wind up being a triple threat. Maybe they could do some sort of a... Uh, a double turn and complete the babyface Seth Rollins turn and complete the Roman Reigns heel turn all at the Clash of Champions. But I think at some point Roman Reigns is going to have to do something that really solidifies him as a heel. And I think maybe the Clash of Champions could be the place to do it. So we'll have to see what they do, whether or not we get that triple threat universal title match or if we get two one-on-one -on -one matches between Rollins and Owens and Rusev and Roman Reigns. As far as what else happened on Monday Night Raw, I did mention that Bailey defeated Charlotte in a non-title match. Dana Brooke got involved in that and kind of fucked up a little bit. Uh, she's been fucking up a lot. I don't know why Charlotte and Dana are even associated with each other at all, but eventually you know Charlotte is going to completely kick Dana to the curb, and uh, it should be happening pretty much immediately. So that match, we all thought, kind of put Bailey at the front of the line for a women's title shot, but hold the phone. Sasha Banks returned to Raw tonight. She tweeted out earlier in the day that she had a big announcement and that the news was bad. So here we go again with this uh, retirement speculation. We saw it with the Dudley boys a couple of weeks ago. Now Sasha comes out. I didn't really think that she was injured so badly that she had to retire. To me, this was clearly a work. She was going to go through the motions and act all sad only to reveal that she's not retiring at all. So she's out there, you know, trying to give her speech and, and be all emotional. And then Dana Brooke comes out and interrupts her. Sasha Banks even called Dana Brooke Miss Piggy, which I think is an insult to Miss Piggy, and then proceeded to kick Dana Brooke's ass and hit her with the bank statement and the submission. And she gets back on the microphone and says, the bad news that I was referring to was for Charlotte. The bad news is that I'm back and I'm coming for my title and I'm getting the title shot at the Clash of Champions. So apparently it's going to be Sasha Banks getting the rematch versus Charlotte and I don't know where this leaves Bailey. I don't know if they'll insert her into this thing at some point as a triple threat or if Bailey will meet the winner of this thing. I don't know. But Sasha is back. She is not retiring. She just needed a couple of weeks off, I guess, to deal with a couple of nagging injuries. And she's got the title match against Charlotte. Just a couple of other noteworthy things from Raw, and we'll move on to SmackDown here. Sheamus is up 3 nothing on Cesaro. So I kind of like this. I mean, this is, Cesaro's now going to have to battle back. I don't know if we've ever seen a best of seven series that ended in a sweep, so I can't really see that happening. So you would have to assume that Cesaro is going to start to battle back uh, in the next couple of weeks. We also had that horrible comedy segment with Gallows and Anderson in the New Day. I hate it when WWE does like stuff like this. I mean, I don't know why they think any of this shit is funny. Gallows and Anderson were such badasses in Japan, and they've come over to the WWE, and they've just been booked in such a silly-ass way. 
I mean, some of it's been entertaining. I liked some of the doctor skits that they did a couple of weeks ago, but I think that should just be limited to a week or two and not do it all the time. And I know they're feuding with the New Day, and the New Day is kind of a goofy team anyway. But I think Gallows and Anderson should stay themselves and stay the badasses that they are and stop being booked like fucking jokes. But uh, they brought out all these old imposter New Days, you know, what New Day is going to look like when they're 80 years old and they're out there in walkers. Reminded me of the Huckster and the Nacho Man skits 20 years ago. I imagine Vince back there at Gorilla just laughing his ass off, thinking it's the funniest thing he's ever seen. Uh, when really it's just horribly lame and boring. The crowd didn't know what to make of it. All of us on Twitter were just scratching our heads like, this is fucking ridiculous. So anyway, Gallows and Anderson are getting the title shot at the Clash of Champions, and hopefully that will be it for the new day. Gallows and Anderson can win the tag belts and start uh, running with them, hopefully successfully. I want to see them, you know, tear through the competition. I want to see them be badass tag team champions. That's what they're there to do. That's what WWE needs to use them for. Uh, Not stupid-ass skits like this. So that's pretty much Raw in a nutshell. I didn't want to discuss everything. Uh, Darren Young did defeat uh, Jinder Mahal. Uh, Strowman beat Sin Cara via countout. Nia Jax had another squash match. Uh, The Shining Stars uh, defeated Enzo and Cass. Actually, I should mention that because that surprised me. The Shining Stars, a team that nobody gives a shit about, actually got a victory on Raw over a pretty over-tag team. So... We'll see if Shining Stars can start building a little bit of momentum and get the fans caring about them at all. Uh, I think it's going to take a lot more than one fluke victory over Enzo and Cass to do that, however. So we'll see where they go leading into Clash of Champions. We have a couple of weeks before that pay-per-view even happens, so there's more build to come. Uh, The Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins situation I think is very intriguing, especially if you potentially throw in Roman Reigns. Chris Jericho is another wild card in that thing because he's BFFs with Kevin Owens, so you have to wonder at some point, are they going to have a falling out? Is Chris Jericho going to try to interfere on Owens' behalf and fuck up and cost him a match or something like that? So uh, I don't expect the love affair between Jericho and Owens to last too much longer. I think something will definitely happen, but right now I'm thrilled with Kevin Owens as the Universal Champion and the direction that Raw is going in. Such a nice save after what happened to Finn Balor and uh, how devastating that was and how we all thought we were fucked. For WWE to turn around and pull off such a brilliant angle and swerve like that was awesome. So I'm really happy right now with the direction of Raw. SmackDown, I don't know. That's a different story. Um, Backlash is this Sunday, of course, September 11th. And part of the problem I see with having two pay-per-views a month now is that some of them can be considered throwaway pay-per-views. I mean, there's some good matches on Backlash, but to me, in my head, it's not a pay-per-view that is a must-see. As of right now, I am scheduled to be home live tweeting and watching Backlash, so feel free to join me on Twitter. And I will most likely be up here for a post-pay-per-view reaction because of my living situation right now. It might be hard to guarantee that, but I expect uh, that I'll be up here after the pay-per-view to talk about it. But at the same time, I felt like if I missed the show, it wouldn't be that huge. I'm not expecting a title change. Uh, At best, I'm expecting some good in-ring wrestling, but I don't think the world title is going to change hands, and I don't know what really else is even going to happen on that show. I mean, the show is four days away, and as of recording this commentary, there's only five matches announced. So uh, SmackDown on Tuesday, of course, was the go-home show for that. They set up the world title match between Ambrose and Styles in a pretty lame segment that closed the show. The main event was just an interview between AJ Styles and Dean Ambrose. Both did fantastic jobs on the mic. Dean is great. I'm liking his character. I like everything about Dean Ambrose. I like him as the WWE champion. He's impressing me more than I thought he would, and he seems to really own that spot. He really seems confident in that role. And that's one of the major things I look for when I see a guy that's being a world champion for the first time is how they handle it. And when you look at Dean Ambrose, he's fucking fearless out there. Kevin Owens is the same way. Those are your two world champions right now, Kevin Owens and Dean Ambrose. Those two guys were working against each other for the Intercontinental title not eight months ago. So to see what has happened to them and where they have gone this year and the heights that they've made it to is uh, thrills me. So I couldn't be happier with WWE's two current world champions. But with that being said, the overall segment between Ambrose and AJ I thought was a little bit lame. All that happened was AJ kicked Dean in the nuts, which if Dean is so street smart, he should have been able to see that coming. And he just got nut shot and the show went off the air. So uh, Dean Ambrose versus AJ Styles at Backlash is set, and I'll talk about my predictions for that match in just a minute. Uh, as far as what else happened on SmackDown, not a whole lot except for the Usos finally turned heel. It's about time. 
very baffling situation too because uh, they were set to face American Alpha in the next round of the tournament. This was a match that I was hoping and thought would be the finals at Backlash. I thought it would be Alpha versus the Usos, and the Usos would turn heel on that or something. Uh, but American Alpha faced the Usos in a match that I've been looking forward to, and it lasted 30 seconds, maybe not even 30 seconds. The Usos jump American Alpha from behind. They fight back and are able to nail Jimmy or Jay with their finisher and have him pinned within a matter of seconds. And that prompts the full-blown heel turn after the match. The Usos, out of frustration, kick the shit out of American Alpha and injure Gable's knee. And what wound up happening is later on during Talking Smack, Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan announced that American Alpha is out. They will not be in the finals of the tag team tournament. And Rhino and Heath Slater won their match earlier on in the night. So they are supposed to take on American Alpha for the new SmackDown tag team titles. But now that American Alpha is out, what Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon chose to do is make a second chance match, I think on the pre-show, between the Hype Brothers and the Usos, the two teams that lost on SmackDown, the winner of that will move on to the finals to face Heath Slater and Rhino on the main pay-per-view. Now, to me, that's weird because why would you why would you reward the Usos for that? The Usos jumped the team after a match they lost fair and square. Then they deliberately injured another athlete, and then you're, you're going to reward them with a potential title shot? You know, for the Usos to turn heel, I'm happy about. I hope they change up their look, too. I've always thought they were way too colorful. Uh, I love their entrance music, and I love the beginning chanting part of their entrance, but I absolutely hate with all my heart that stupid part where they say, we say Us and you say oh, and it's just, oh, I fucking hate that. So that's probably going to go away now, which makes me happy. Hopefully the Usos will maybe dress a little darker. I mean, there's been some pretty vicious, nasty, dangerous tag teams in that Samoan bloodline. So I would like to see them maybe kind of do a throwback to that. Maybe they could bring in a manager. Maybe Rikishi can come in and manage the two of them. Much like Afa managed the Head Shrinkers back in the day or whatever. So I would like to see them do something like that with the Usos. And I'm excited for their potential heel run. But it almost seems like they're in a lose-lose situation here. If the WWE already has plans to give Slater and Rhino the belts... The Usos are going to lose out here because now they're brand new heels and then they're going to lose in their first outing either to the Hype Bros or to Slater and Rhino. So I'm a little bit nervous about that whole situation, but at the end of the day, I'm thrilled that the Usos have finally, finally, finally turned heel. We had The Miz defeating Apollo Crews on SmackDown. Dolph Ziggler is on commentary. Dolph Ziggler has now moved on to a feud with The Miz, and he's going to be getting an Intercontinental title shot at Backlash, so we'll have to see how that goes. Um, It looks like the potential Miz versus Daniel Bryan feud will not be happening. That crazy segment they had on Talking Smack a couple of weeks ago, they got the internet buzzing that maybe, possibly, Daniel Bryan could return to the ring. I mean, you can't have a promo like that, and then they just forget about it and drop it but apparently that's exactly what they've done they also set up the big women's match there's going to be like a six woman match for the new smackdown women's championship at backlash and i think the show opened with a big promo with all the girls you know whatever that was what it was then we had a six woman tag match with uh, becky naomi and nikki bella taking on carmella alexa bliss and natalia and nikki tapped out to carmella So they're starting a feud with those two ladies as well, and Carmella better watch her ass because my girl's going to fuck her up. Randy Orton also cut a backstage promo on SmackDown as well, furthering his feud with Bray Wyatt. And I like what he did. He kind of cut a promo in a storytelling type of way, much like how Bray Wyatt does it, and basically said, when you fuck with a snake, you get bit. So I'm sure these matches between these two will be good. And uh, they are set to face at Backlash on Sunday. Randy Orton, of course, has to face Brock Lesnar at a live event later on this month. So I can't imagine Orton dropping this match. So it might not be good news for Bray Wyatt, but we'll see what happens at Backlash. Speaking of Backlash, let's go ahead and predict this thing. These are going to be very half-assed predictions because I know as the week progresses here, we're going to get more matches announced for this thing. We're going to get a couple of pre-show matches announced as well. So I'm only going to predict what I have which is really five or six matches, I believe. Uh, The pre-show, of course, has the Usos versus the Hype Bros. Uh, The winner takes on Heath Slater and Rhino for the tag team titles on the main card. I would probably say Usos in this match. You you would think they have to. I, I would hope that the Usos beat the Hype Bros, go on to face Slater and Rhino in the finals, and maybe have American Alpha do a run-in or interfere or do something to cost the Usos the title. 
giving them to Slater and Rhino, and then Slater can finally get his SmackDown contract, and then the Usos and American Alpha can move into their feud together. So to me, that seems the most likely scenario, so I'm going to predict the Usos to beat the Hype Bros. I am going to predict, I'll go ahead and predict that now since we're on the subject, I will predict Heath Slater and Rhino to win the SmackDown Tag Team titles. Not really the team I wanted to be the first champions of SmackDown. To me, those titles should either go to the Usos or American Alpha. But it looks like right now all signs are pointing to Heath Slater and Rhino, so that's who I'm going to predict. The WWE title match, Dean Ambrose versus AJ Styles. I'm expecting a really good match here, and I'm expecting Ambrose to walk out with the belt. I know AJ Styles is going to win that belt. Eventually, he has to. He's defeated John Cena. He's on a roll. The brands are split. They want him to be a big part of SmackDown. They're trying to build new guys, new champions. They've just done that on Raw with Finn Balor and Kevin Owens. Dean Ambrose won the belt for the first time a few months ago. So putting the belt on Styles is definitely something I see WWE doing. But I would like to have them wait just a tiny bit longer. Maybe one more pay-per-view or maybe even two more pay-per-views. I've mentioned before that I think the WWE wants to strike while the iron's hot with AJ, and I still think they're going to do that, but I think they can afford to prolong this one more pay-per-view at least. So hopefully Dean Ambrose comes out on top of this match, infuriating AJ Styles, and they get another match together at the next pay-per-view, and AJ eventually ends up winning the title there in the future. And then once AJ becomes champion, our old buddy John Cena will probably be coming back onto the scene, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if when John Cena ends up beating AJ Styles to give him his receipt for SummerSlam, that a title happens to be on the line. So I'm predicting Dean Ambrose to come out of this match as the winner. The Miz and Dolph Ziggler, I'm going to predict the Miz to retain the Intercontinental title. You're already going to have two champions crowned with the women's title and the tag team title, so I really don't see any of the other belts changing hands on this show. Which brings me to the women's match. I already predicted the tag team title match. As far as the women go, I'm going to go out on a crazy limb here. Why not? This is a pay-per-view I don't care a whole lot about. It's not even a big deal. I might as well throw some crazy-ass predictions out there. And I'm actually going to go with Natalia. I think when you're launching a new title, somebody needs to hold that belt that's significant or has some sort of a legacy. People respect Natalia. She's been in the WWE for a long time. Uh, she's a leader to a lot of these women. Uh, she comes from that great Hart family legacy that has spawned so many legendary wrestlers and just her her family and her bloodline alone, to me, is enough to put a belt on her. So if you're going to make Natalia the first ever champion, I can't think of anyone better. I'd like to see Becky win it. Of course, you know I'd love to see Nikki win it, but Nikki has already been the longest-running Divas champion ever. She already has one big accolade. She doesn't need another one. You might as well give it to uh, Natalia. I mean, she's put her time in there. A lot of times it seems like she's second fiddle to some of these other girls, even though she's a great wrestler. I think some of the other girls get a little bit more attention than her sometimes, so it might be a nice bone to throw to Natalia. So I'm going to predict Natalia to win this match. Carmella and Nikki can continue their feud after this. Uh, Natalia can maybe work with Becky for the title or something like that, and Becky can eventually win it from her. Bray Wyatt versus Randy Orton, you know, that's kind of an easy one to predict. Randy Orton's got a big match with Brock Lesnar in a couple of weeks. He's not going to lose to Bray Wyatt, so I predict Randy Orton to defeat Bray Wyatt. Where this feud goes from here, I don't know. I mean, a lot of fans get really pissed about some of the things that happen to Bray Wyatt because every time he feuds with a big star, he always comes out on the losing end. John Cena, Roman Reigns, Undertaker. So I don't really see anything different with Randy Orton. I expect Orton to uh, defeat Bray Wyatt and uh, build momentum to his match with Brock in Chicago. Those are the matches I have written down, so that's all I can really predict. Uh, Before I get out of here, we'll mention a couple of other things. Uh, UFC 203 is this Saturday. CM Punk makes his debut in a match with Mickey Gall. Don't really know much about his opponent. Uh, I can tell you this. I'm rooting hard for CM Punk. Very hard. We all should. Whether you like CM Punk or not, this is a wrestler. This is one of us. We do not want to see him go into UFC and get his ass kicked. And I would like to see CM Punk prove everybody wrong. Brock Lesnar already did that. And if CM Punk goes in there and gets knocked out in one round... I'm going to be hugely bummed. So I'm rooting for CM Punk to win. Hopefully UFC has put somebody in front of him that's beatable. Like I said, I don't know much about this Mickey Gall. So hopefully this kid is beatable and CM Punk uh, can end up defeating him. I mean, hell, he's been training for almost two years. You would think 
that uh, he should be ready for a fight here. So I'm rooting hard for CM Punk. I won't be home to watch this thing live or stream it or anything like that. I'm going to have to just catch the results of it. So uh, those of you that are watching this fight, please tweet me updates. Let me know how it's going. I'm hoping CM Punk wins with a submission or something like that. I think would be perfect instead of it going a decision or whatever. And I just hope that CM Punk does not get knocked out, especially early. If it goes a few rounds and CM Punk gets knocked out, at least he... He made an effort, but if he goes down in 30 seconds or something like that, I'm going to be hugely embarrassed for him. Apparently, him and Colt Cabana have broken up, somebody was telling me. Uh, I guess that uh, Colt Cabana went to a WWE show and went backstage and took pictures and all that, and it pissed off CM Punk, uh, which is silly because his fucking wife worked there for months after he had left the company. So for him to be mad at Colt Cabana for going backstage and seeing some friends, who fucking cares? What the hell's wrong with you, CM Punk? I'm sure there's probably a little bit more to that story, but that's uh, what I had heard, that it had something to do with Colt uh, making an appearance backstage at a WWE show, and that seems silly. What are these guys, fucking 10 years old? Uh, Speaking of 10-year-olds, Scott Hall's back in the news. Man, Scott Hall, Jesus, you know, you were doing so well. Anyway, he had a little relapse. He was drunk at an airport bar, I think at TGI Fridays, which is kind of funny. Uh, Somebody caught it on camera. He was being rude to the bartender. They called the cops. Nobody was arrested. He didn't get in trouble. I don't even think he was that hammered. He was just doing a couple tequila shots and drinking some beer and uh, got himself a little drunk, and the cops, you know, calmed the whole thing down. Scott Hall even tweeted earlier today that he did have a little bit of a relapse, but all is good now. So, you know, I guess no harm done, and uh, alcoholism and addiction is a big problem, and I, I feel for anybody that has this, but, you know, for somebody that's not addicted and has never been addicted to anything, to me, I don't understand why these people can't fucking stay clean. God, he was doing so well. What the, the work that DDP did with him and Jake Roberts was so unbelievable, and it was an absolute miracle that he was able to clean these two guys up. So hopefully this is just a small little dip in the road, and Scott Hall can get himself back on track and stay clean and stay sober. Please, Scott Hall, we are all pulling for you. Also, Alberto Del Rio uh, apparently is completely done with WWE. When he came back last year in that match with John Cena, apparently it was just a one-year deal. And there's been stories how when he came back, he was in in good graces with WWE. Vince McMahon really liked him. They started promising him a bunch of shit, including being a Paul Heyman guy. And as things typically tend to go in the WWE, none of those promises were followed through on. He was getting frustrated with everything, and he really just didn't have any intention of re-signing with them when his contract was up. He also had started a relationship with Paige. He's going through a divorce. Uh, WWE was not happy with Paige being involved in that relationship, apparently even threatening to release her if she didn't break up with him. They both got popped for a wellness policy violation a few weeks ago, so they're both sitting out. Uh, But Del Rio, when his suspension is up, he will not be coming back to the company, apparently, and he's going to be leaving again. And I say good. I was happy as hell when Del Rio came back. I mean, he showed back up and defeated John Cena clean for a championship after being out of the company for, you know, a year or whatever it was. So for him to come back, I was thrilled with because I think he's a good wrestler. I love Del Rio. I think he's good in the ring. I think he's a good talker. I think he has a great look. Uh, I like everything about the guy. So why WWE couldn't figure out anything fun to do with him, I don't know. He's probably better off in uh, the Independence or Lucha Underground or in Mexico or whatever. And I wish Alberto Del Rio nothing but the best, and uh, I hope he tweets a big fuck you to the WWE once his contract is up. Good luck with everything, Alberto Del Rio. Really bummed out things didn't work out for you in the WWE, but I'm excited to see where your career goes in the future, and I'm sure he will be a lot happier and make probably just as much money. Wouldn't be surprised to see him head over to TNA either. Maybe he can even work one of those what culture shows. I know Cody Rhodes uh, might be going to TNA in the near future and Ring of Honor, and he's been busy. So Alberto Del Rio, I'm sure, can do the same thing and get the same type of paydays. So anyway, that is it for me. It's been a long couple of days of recording and editing, trying to get you guys a couple of videos up since uh, my life is a little bit upside down right now. Like I said, join me on Sunday to live tweet at Good Mike Work during Backlash. I'll be giving my opinions throughout the show, and hopefully I'll be up here right after the show to give you a reaction to that. You guys have a great rest of your week. Leave me all your thoughts about everything we talked about here tonight in the comments below, and I will talk to you in just a few days. Until next time, peace.